Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for coming around today as webinar on violent and aggressive behavior with uh, Matthew Bennett. It is a, it's a really good, great topic to discuss as it is a growing, growing concern within New Zealand. And we just see it on every day's tabloids. We, we hear about it in every, every uh, worker's mouth these days. So it's really a, a growing concern. And um, I do value these types of webinars on sharing their experiences and knowledge of how to prevent these and reduce these types of risks within our own um, uh, site business. Yeah, just a bit of quick things for you from a housekeeping perspective. Uh, Matt, can you just go to the next, please? Webinar is being recorded. So, yes, uh, next week. Um, so, for if you want to re uh, review this uh, webinar at the later stage or share it with anybody else, you're more than welcome to do so. Other than that, um, I just got confirmation. Thank you very much, everybody, that the chat function is working. If you've got any comments or Are you there, Matt? Yeah, um, I'm hoping that problem wasn't on my end. Uh, yeah, it seems like we're, oh, there's a bit of a glitchy connection here, guys. I do apologize for that. Um, Wes, it might be worth, uh, although it's not ideal, just if you turn off your camera, it might just uh, help. Hey folks, um, I'm in the chat. Just quickly, I've lost. Uh, I've lost Wes. Can can you just uh, somebody just pop in a note if you're able to hear me? It might be worth me just launching through to the presentation whilst Wes tries to connect. Looks like I've got a, a yip from Nicola. Great. Okay, so um, I'm sure Wes will uh, rejoin us um, uh, when he can. Um, um, but uh, I'm just going to I'm just going to start um, heading forward, um, <clears throat> and um, yeah, we'll take it from there. Uh, I'm back, guys. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I do apologize. Um, at the start of this webinar, I had a dead spot, so I'm just the hot spotting on the cellular network. I do apologize for that. Um, yeah, guys. Um, I'll just quickly carry on where I left off. Uh, if you've got any questions for myself or Mac, use the question and answer function. Um, then I'll just give you a quick run through our up and coming webinars. Next week, you can expect the um, ergonomics and workplace wearables from Arno Durat from ExoVantage. Then you've got myself. I've done a quite a bit of work around critical risks within the manufacturing, retail supply chain, road transport section. Join us for some of those key insights and some opportunities that are available. Then please don't miss out on the eight part machine safety series with a really experienced individual, uh, Mr. Brent Sutton. And these uh, series of webinars are only 30 minutes long and they start on the 8th of November and they finish on the 21st of March. They give about two, three weeks gap for each 30 minute webinar. Make sure you join that one. Um, this individual is really experienced when it comes to machine safety. 
Then we've got uh, Darren Cottingham. He's been doing some extremely exciting work with a lot of organizations internationally on falling asleep at the wheel, how fatigue is killing our workers in general. So please don't miss that one. And then lastly, we've got Chain of Responsibility for Supply Chains with Kelly McClucky and Paul Gaynor, both from a logistics point of view, as well as from, from uh, they, they basically taking the Australia model and implementing it within New Zealand, and they are pretty much involved with the uh, Wakukutahi, WorkSafe, etc. So please watch out for that one as well. Then last from my point of view, guys, um, critical risks. We've done quite a bit of work around critical risks. As I mentioned the report earlier on, if you don't have a copy of the report, please go onto our website and download a copy or email me and I'll, I'll, I'll shoot you a copy. We've done, uh, we've got a couple of other resources available like hierarchies of controls. We've got a comprehensive driver safety guide as well as bow ties that will be up and running about next week. We're doing a bit of work with Skills VR, especially with, um, some big retailers out there, which is really immersive um, de-escalation VAB training. Um, so I'm, I'll be happy to give a bit more news about that one uh, once I can. And then we've got a, a pretty a, a big project as well with um, a couple of regulatory op um, operations within New Zealand. I hope to give you a bit more clarity on what that looks like. Then lastly, site markings project that should be finished roughly by December. Um, as we know, there's no real guidance on standards on what good site markings would look like for any site. Um, and hence, um, we are shop getters doing a bit of work around um, that for WorkSafe. And then we've got participative ergonomics, guys. This is a model for retail supply chain um, that we are basically going to modify from the Chazan's model, which is called work should not hurt. Um, it will really be focused on early intervention, injury management, first move manual handling, and how we can identify some of those early things and how we can do better and, and trying to prevent and reduce some of those musculoskeletal uh, disorder in injuries. Well, uh, sorry uh, for that. That was a pretty nutshell. That was pretty quick. But uh, before I go on, I would just want to say thank you uh, to Matthew Bennett for uh, taking the time today and sharing your experience with us. And before I hand over, guys, Matthew Bennett, I don't know if he's done his intro already, but he's worked across the globe in various industries. And he's currently based in the South Island as a health and safety manager for A.W. Fraser. He comes with a wealth of experience and knowledge, and I'm pretty excited about today's one uh, with Matthew. Matthew, thank you very much. I'll hand over to you. Guys, I'll be in the background uh, just monitoring the chat in Q&A. Hey, thanks for, thanks for that intro, Wes. Um, yeah. Um, now, before I launch into um, my um, sort of introduction, you'll see up on the screen I've posed, uh, I have three questions for you. Um, and just as I'm chatting, if you can consider these questions and throw your answers to them in the chat. Um, uh, again, you'll see the first two are, are closed questions, you know, yes, no, awareness recurrence, and then the third one asks you to throw in a, a sentence. Um, and we'll come back to that in a, in a few moments. <clears throat> so uh, when Wes approached me about this presentation, I, I naively said yes. Uh, he then told me it was an hour long. And I realized that uh, that's twice the length of the average TV show or 37 times uh, longer than the average TikTok. Uh, so I now have the uh, formidable task of being more engaging than Mark Richardson and the block uh, without the advantage of uh, advertising breaks or um, adult beverages. Um, so I guess uh, please be uh, gentle on me, but your feedback would be really much appreciated at the end of this, whether that's uh, an email to me or uh, to, to Wes. Um, this is the first time I've actually presented in a, a webinar format. Um, uh, so yeah, it's, um, uh, I'm always keen to, to, to get better. So my working career started um, uh, with working with youth, um, what we'd now call these days youth at risk. <clears throat> and I have a a vivid memory of um, being on a multi-day cave course and at one point I found myself having to coach a very large and very scared uh, young man uh, down an abseil uh, through a tight and dark space. 
when I returned from that course, I got into the office and, and sitting on the fax machine, uh, that shows my age, um, uh, sitting on the fax machine was a, a message and it said, uh, be careful with Eddie, he's on police directed diversion. He is prone to physical aggression and lashing out when stressed or cornered. Um, at that point in time, I, I definitely questioned a lot of my life choices and, and now I end up here. Um, I don't question my life choices so much, but I definitely gained a lot of um, uh, reason to examine and think about how we go about uh, setting up and planning our work. Um, so on that note, I'm just going to get Wes. Um, I'm hoping I've given you an adequate time to, to think about those questions. I'm going to get Wes to just give us a summary of what's coming up in the chat. I'm hoping that some, uh, there's some good answers in there. Yeah, to no surprise, um, some of the things I've received so far, um, Matthew, is that majority so far has been saying yes, everybody's saying, saying it's occurrence, and it seems to be a pretty general theme when it comes to question three, societal frustration, poverty, lack of consequences, et cetera. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, uh, um, that's, a, that's, that's pretty much what I would have expected to see as well. Um, uh, yeah, there is a lack of really substantive data um, in this space. However, uh, crime statistics do show that um, uh, this kind of um, event is on the increase. Um, while generally we're seeing a decrease in crime, um, this sort of behaviour is, is on, on the rise. Um, so the journey I'm going to take you, um, I'm going to start very uncomfortably on the 1st of September uh, 2014 in Ashburton. Um, uh, this is a, to me, is a, it's a, an absolute tragic event. And I feel so sad for all the people involved. All they were trying to do, uh, was go to work and do the best job they could with the resources available to them. Um, and I, I think it's really important that we remember that while we look at that event, that this is not about the, those individuals and what they did or didn't do, should or shouldn't have done. It's about what we can learn from it. And that's where I want to sit, is um, really looking at the judge's ruling. Um, uh, because it's, it's really easy to negate this event because of the offender. And it's very easy to focus or get fixated on the gun. The judge does neither of those. Uh, the significance of this event is actually um, in his ruling where he determines that violence and aggression are factors a workplace needs to consider and respond to. And he identifies what he considers reasonable steps or mitigations that could be taken. He doesn't focus on the weapon. He doesn't focus on bulletproof glass or um, a, a, an airlock double door uh, security system. Um, he's given us a mandate um, and an effective starting point to think about our workplace and what we, we can and should be doing. <clears throat> so in this slide, uh, I'd like you to take a few moments to think about your workplace um, in the context of this, uh, this matrix or this table that I've given you. Um, uh, we look at, I, I, I look at uh, the nature of the, the aggressor um, is it a person that we know? This could be a member of our staff, uh, it could be a contractor, um, or it could be a regular customer, a frequent flyer. Um, unknown persons, um, people that are just passing by, they see our car or our truck on the side of the street. Um, uh, it could be um, just a random person that decides to phone up somebody that we've never had an interaction before um, and have no reason to be um, uh, uh, concerned about. And then I look at the nature of the work site. Um, is it a site that, that uh, I control? So the offices that we, we occupy, um, a depot, um, a construction site or a, a temporary work site that we have a fence around? Um, or are we operating in somebody else's workspace? Um, um, might not be so relevant to this audience, but we could be going to um, inspect or visit another premises. 
um, uh, you could be going to one of your customers or suppliers work site. Um, uh, you could be out on the road. Um, um, these are places that we often find ourselves working, but we're not necessarily in direct control. So I'll be coming back to this table in a few moments, but I wanted to give you a chance to think about where your workplace sits. Um, you might find yourself sitting in purely one quadrant or you could find your people spread out across all of those, but understanding um, uh, where we're working and how we're, you know, who we're interacting with is, is, a, is a great place to start. Okay, so now I introduce the, the concept, the bow tie uh, model. I'm, I'm, I suspect many of you are, have varying degrees of familiarity with the bow tie model. Um, this is obviously, or not obviously, but I've, I've stripped this down to a, a, um, uh, a simple or straightforward um, uh, scene. Um, on the left-hand side, we have our preventative actions um, uh, and the things that we do um, to uh, essentially to prevent an, uh, an undesirable occurrence. Um, and on the right hand side is the things we do um, to respond or recover when that event has occurred. Um, the top event, the image I always have of a top event um, uh, for me is um, uh, driving a car into a corner in the winter. Um, when I enter that corner, my speed is set. The top event occurs at that moment um, and things really start going wrong when I hit that frost or that ice and I lose traction or I don't but the top event is that point of entry moments before I lose traction because I've set all the criteria for the event to occur in the context of um, uh, you know violence and aggression in the workplace uh, my the way I consider or perceive the top event is that moment where the other person loses emotional control of themselves. Essentially, they stop being rational and uh, the, the staff person or myself fail to identify that that's happening. At that point, we have all the conditions required for it to start going. Um, in an undesirable direction. However, the traditional bow tie as I present it here, I don't think actually does a, the right, presents the right comprehension of the situation. So in this version, you can see down the bottom, I've added the timeline. And all of a sudden we start seeing that, I think we've got you know, years, months, weeks, and days to put in place the preventative barriers. But once that top event occurs, we're talking minutes and seconds before it starts heading into that space that we really lose control. The car is now skidding. Um, the, uh, the customer or the other person has lost complete emotional, uh, control rational thought and they're now taking a swing at the person or yelling uncontrollably aggressively um, uh, threateningly to to the staff our staff and so um, again this to me really draws my attention to the fact that my work now is the most important thing because when when that event occurs you know, all bets are off. So the question comes, what are we going to do? Um, uh, what are, what can we do? Where should we be placing our, um, uh, um, our planning and, and, and attention? Uh, so let's understand the problem. How does uh, violence, uh, aggression um, present in the workplace? Um, it's complex, it's multifaceted, uh, it can be physical, it can be 
um, through actual contact, somebody taking a punch at one of my staff. It could just be merely body language, posturing, um, that classic in your face, puffed up chest, elbows raised, um, uh, verbally, the words that the person uses um, can be, you know, can be threatening, can be aggressive, um, the tone of language. Um, and it can also be in the form of a written form. Um, it can be on social media, it could be uh, emails, letters. Um, uh, obviously, when it's uh, physical contact, that to me, in my opinion, is uh, violence, um, it's assault. Um, and I'm really, really clear that um, that is, um, while it is a workplace responsibility, when it becomes violence, and becomes assault, we do need to be reporting this to the police. Um, uh, I would argue that um, when we have um, threatening behaviour to varying degrees, we need to say, ask ourselves, is this just merely a loss of emotional control or are they actually making a threat with the intent or designing or planning to follow through on that threat? At that point, we should also be thinking about um, uh, involving the police. Um, uh, down the bottom, you can see that I've, uh, I've, I've included bullying and intimidation. Um, and when this is our staff uh, exhibiting this behavior towards our staff, that is bullying and intimidation, harassment. Um, now that's a huge field. Um, I want to be cautious of not going into that space, but I also need to acknowledge that it occurs um, and that is something we need to be thinking about. Um, upshot, all of this is psychosocial harm. We ha I take an, a, a, an intolerant position of this um, in the workplace because I do see the, the impact that, that uh, um, uh, words, body language, tone of voice um, uh, have on, on the, the well-being of our people. And uh, so addressing it and saying, you know, it doesn't matter how it presents itself, it's harm. And we need, you know, we're going to be taking a proactive stance uh, to improve this is really important to me. Um, so that's that's my quick kind of snapshot, I suppose, of uh, how I see this presenting in the presenting in the workplace. Um, I also want to point out that that digital, that social media space, uh, massively complicated, and I, I don't really, I, I don't want to claim I have any expertise in that, but I still care about it. It's still something um, I want to try and improve and and. and or prevent, I suppose, protect staff from in the workplace, but it's uh, ooh, complicated for sure. Anybody that has uh, young children in, uh, in school in particular will be um, feeling uh, a degree of anxiety, I suppose, around that. Our young people are, are struggling with um, um, living, in a, living their life in a social media environment. Mm. Right, jumping forward. So I said I was going to come back to this uh, this 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 uh, matrix, this table. Um, I'm you know I haven't asked you to type in your your thoughts on this, um, other than just asked you to consider who, the work environment that you have and and the nature of the people that your staff interact with. I think it's very important that we understand um, the things I control, the things I influence, and the things I care about. Um, uh, I care about my staff. I care about my staff's well-being. Um, uh, I can't control the way that the, the public will interact or other people will interact with our staff. I can influence it a little bit. Um, uh, I can control the design, the physical layout of my workplace. Uh, I have direct control over that. Um, it's really important that I don't mix up that sequence. I don't start trying to control people that are not working for me. Um, I will have very little success in that space. Um, uh, I can influence um, their behavior to a point. 
Um, I can certainly influence my the the conduct, the manner of interaction that uh, my staff have. Um, I can't control it. They are independent, self-thinking creatures um, that are responding in the moment. Um, I can control the design of work, um, and that's going to be very important for me to to to. Uh, remember as I go forward in um, uh, in my my planning that left hand side of my bow tie <clears throat> so this is my design strategy uh, my safety and design for protecting my staff from violence and aggression in the workplace I need to understand my threat then I design and separation uh, intentional design of the way we work to protect staff from violence and aggression. I design in de-escalation. And then finally, my recovery strategy when it goes wrong, a planned escape. How do I extract myself or how do my staff extract themselves, themselves from the problem? Uh, and I'll go through each of these four steps um, uh, in the subsequent slides. Understand the threat. Ask your people. Um, we talk about you know, the, the Health and Safety at Work Act and uh, the Guide to Good Governance. There's a whole pile of places where this comes through. Engagement, worker engagement is, you know, work engagement is talk to your people, ask your people. I was doing a, a threat assessment for a particular business um, uh, that I worked for. And uh, as I went through, you know, doing my thing, I started chatting to one of the people about um, what they perceived the problem to be. Um, and uh, it turns out that they were, they were ex-military and did security assessments of military, uh, um, military bases. Um, and I was, all of a sudden, I'm like, I, I, I had my world opened up to a much higher level of thinking. And the level of understanding that um, uh, this person introduced. Now that's a, an extreme case, but it's not until you ask the people that you discover the degree that they understand. They might not be able to articulate what they experience and what they feel um, uh, um, effectively or, or comprehensively, but they are on the sharp end. They will know what um, uh, what happens on a daily basis. What I will say is it's really helpful to give them a model or framework to be able to express what they're experiencing. So again, if you think about uh, the previous slide where I had my, my table, um, the, the nature of the aggressor, um, the nature of the workplace, um, that can be really helpful to get them to explore and explain what's happening or what they're concerned about. Uh, again, I, I emphasize um, this is not exclusively about the external people that we interact with. This could be an internal problem, um, you know, a, a, taking it into that bullying and harassment place. Um, you know, a particular staff person that has an overly assertive or aggressive manner of interacting that just makes people uncomfortable or cringe or, or fearful. Um, so don't focus just on the external problem. Uh, some other things to think about is why would a person um, have issues with you? Um, uh, so thinking about our wins case, um, uh, or the wins situation, I suppose, they've got clientele that are under distress, um, or they could be under the influence of drugs and alcohol. Um, right now, there's a lot of media talk about ram raids, particularly in Auckland, but not exclusively. Um, uh, you know, what is the, what, why are they, why would somebody ram raid this particular venue or location? Um, what have you got that draws them to you? Um, again, we've, you know, we've for a long time thought about banks as being a, a location, a, a, a site of 
um, risk for, for robbery um, and even armed robbery. Um, banking has their, they're actually very advanced in, in how they approach that problem. Um, they've got some very, very intelligent design going on in there. Um, but many of, uh, many of us could have, um, uh, have valuable assets on site that would be, you know, prone for robbery. Um, you know, I'll speak for, for where I work at AW Fraser. Um, we've got uh, brass and bronze that is worth a fortune. You take, you know, one twenty-five kilogram piece of bronze away and, and you've, you know, you've got yourself a, a week's income there potentially. Um, so we have to think about, you know, that in terms of the security of our people. Um, <clears throat> Once I've considered um, uh, my done my threat evaluation, I want to separate my staff from the risk as much as I can. So think about where that interaction is occurring. Um, if you um, are operating a, a, an office-based environment where people are coming through to a reception area, um, the height of the desk, um, you want it to be um, inviting so the customer gets a really positive first reception or first engagement with the customer, uh, sorry, with, uh, with your business, but equally, um, is, it, is it providing protection from the staff? So um, uh, thinking about the height of the desk and the distance from the, between the, the person behind the desk and the customer or you know, the person you're receiving. Um, I have seen uh, video footage where a customer just came straight in, got frustrated, and was able to just lean across the desk and grab a staff person, or did grab the staff person by the collar. Um, and the staff person didn't have enough space behind the desk to even push away. The, they were, their back was up against the wall. Um, uh, in the picture on the top left here, um, uh, we've got a desk that is open on both ends. So if a person came in um, and you know, wanted to get up in the grill of, of one of the, the people behind the desk, um, the staff can escape out the other side. Commonly, I see these reception desks with one end closed. So the person comes in behind the desk and that the staff are trapped behind it. Um, you know, that's a very intimidating working environment. Thinking about your staff going to other people's sites, sites that you don't control. Um, uh, the classic, so uh, I think it was Kainga Ora, um, was finding they had a lot of problems. Their staff were going to houses, knocking on the door, um, and the door would open and they instantly were being, feeling very threatened, very uncomfortable. Um, uh, and, I often put this in the, the context of the homeowner or the, the resident. You knock on the door, so you hear a knock on the door and you open the door and there's somebody standing right there, potentially with a clipboard or in a uniform, you're on the back foot. That person, you know, that resident, that occupant is already feeling a little bit intimidated. So good practice, knock on the door, step backwards. And you actually see, uh, people that are used to going into high threat uh, environments, um, what's behind the door is unknown. So they will tend to knock on the door, step backwards and to the non hinge side. And that gives um, a lot more time and space. Um, now that's a very advanced, very um, uh, um, tactical, uh, approach. I hope that we're not working in those, uh, you know, I hope that we're not working in those kind of environments, but it's, it's that level of thinking that we need to be considering. And if you are in those really high risk, high threat environments, um, and this is uh, news to you, or you haven't thought, you, you, you haven't been involved in this kind of tactical thinking, I really encourage you to seek out uh, some, some expert, um, uh, some expert input. Um, and then uh, down my bottom right hand corner, 
I mean, this is a this is a scene from a, a U.S. construction site um, uh, that may or may not be a, a problem. But I mean, I could you know, my time as a, a worksafe inspector, I remember working in Telpo, and I showed up on a construction site. Um, a builder was up on a, a very rickety. Um, a temporary scaffold um, only three of the four feet of the scaffold were actually in contact with the ground and um and uh the the my first interaction with them was uh, i said uh you know introduced myself and said hey uh, do you mind hopping down off the scaffold and he said to me why i said well i'd rather have a conversation and uh um uh, in, in in face to face rather than be shouting at you from a distance um and his response was to throw his hammer at me. Um, that taught me uh, taught me a lot. Um, and distance was really important. Um, looking at our photo here, um, uh, the you know, you can see three or four helmets looking over the bridge, and they've got their back to two people behind them. If this was an, a high risk, a high threat environment. You know the people. You know if you've got your back to the to somebody who's uh, angry at you, you're not really in a position to know what's going on. So thinking about how we enter a scene is really important. Um, again, um, I made that reference. Uh, I I don't want to be yelling at you. I'd rather talk face to face, and that that uh, provides us some insight into um, the intentional design of work. Uh, and designed to de-escalate. Um, and that's really important. How are we asking our staff to go about their work, to interact with um, uh, customers, clients, and members of the public? Um, are we setting them up to start an adversarial relationship? Or are we starting with them, uh, setting them up to start um, talking um, in a collegial, collaborative manner? Um, the U.S. Parks Rangers, um, in conjunction with an organization called Leave No Trace, um, have instigated a program called the Authority of the Resource. So a park ranger will go up to someone, they might be having a fire where they shouldn't be, like a campfire, or they might have left some rubbish behind, or they may have you know, a dog in a, um, a wildlife area that they're not supposed to. They've got a, an authoritarian engagement response or a, a regulatory responsibility. However, they are trained to start the interaction by standing side by side. Uh, they stand next to or shoulder to shoulder with the person and they look to the, the resource, the, the, the natural space, and they start the conversation off by finding why is this person, what does this person value about the space? And when it comes to say, sir, ma'am, I need you to have your dog on a leash, it's based on a mutual understanding of why that's important. This is a really intentional design to the way they go about their work. You might be wondering why I've thrown a, a picture of a bowl of fruit and muffins in there. Uh, and this is the same uh, intentional design and designed to escalate thinking. And just bear with me as I, as I tell you the story. It, it is based on a, a really powerful research piece of paper that you can replicate at work. So we'll have morning teas or lunches or celebratory events. And we'll put out, um, we used to put out, you know, savory rolls, you know, sausage rolls and, and muffins. Um, and everybody had eaten them up and feel fantastic. And then, uh, you know, health and safety and, and well-being came along. We thought maybe we should add some, uh, some healthy choices there. So we put out some fruit and invariably the muffins still got eaten um, uh, and the fruit didn't go quite so much. Um, but if you put the muffins and the fruit in the bowl together, more fruit will get eaten. And the question came, why? And now you're asking the person to make a choice. And they can, you know, they, they reach out their hand and they might go for the muffin, but they'll see the fruit and be like, ah, you know what? I should take some fruit. I should be healthy. They're now making an intentional choice for health. And then you take it to the next level. Put a mirror behind the fruit and muffin and almost all the fruit goes and the muffins stay. Because now it's not just about uh, the choice, 
they can see themselves making a choice. The mirror is so powerful. When we see what we're doing, when it's replayed back to us, we become instantly reflective. So your reception desk, if you put a mirror behind the reception desk and a agitated, um, annoyed, um, frustrated customer or client comes in, them seeing their reflection behind the, the, the reception staff or behind your staff. And we don't like the way we look when we're angry. And so we naturally moderate our behavior down. And um, body cameras have the same effect. Now, a lot of the modern body cameras have a, um, have a screen. And you see this one here has a screen in front of it. The person doesn't really see their image in there but it does remind them that it's being recorded. Um, I was skeptical when uh, the call for the introduction of body cameras came out by some of my previous staff. Um, however, when I dug into the research, I discovered that the body cameras were not about collecting evidence and being able to say, see, this person did it, who was actually preventing it from escalating to that level. Not in all cases, but it significantly uh, tempers the, in, the, the, the interaction. Um, the fact that a person realizes they're being recorded, it's this whole idea of we don't like the way we look when we're angry. And so we moderate ourselves down. Um, we conduct ourselves in a, a more um, collegial manner, I suppose. Um, so again, um, thinking about the way you're designing your work and how you're asking your staff to, um, uh, to interact. Finally, planned escape. While we don't like to think of it going, uh, going sideways, we have to live in a reality that it will. The, 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 the interesting thing about that is um, if we go into it saying this, at some point this will go in the wrong direction, we tend to prevent it from happening more often because we put more intention into, um, uh, into our pre preventative strategies. So the, uh, um, the, the, the thing I always think of when I'm going into these high stress, high threat environments is, that, is this thing of like, um, uh, I can't run through a locked door. What is my exit strategy? How am I going to extract myself from the situation? Now, if it's a, a physical uh, violence or assault scenario, then I need a physical exit strategy. Um, uh, you know, don't don't sit on the uh, away from the door with a, a table between me and the doorway. Sit by the door, kind of stuff. Equally, if it's just a verbal exchange, exchange. How am I going to extract myself from that conversation and say, you know, um, sir, ma'am, it's time for me. I, I, I'm not in a position to continue. I, I don't know how I can progress this conversation. So I'm going to check out right now. Um, uh, I, I dealt with a situation in, in, in the States with a, a very, very um, frustrated and upset uh, parent. Um, and they'd had many dealings uh, with the company I worked for um, and were getting, they were escalating um, in their frustration. And the previous person to deal with them had literally just hung up the phone. They had extracted themselves in the best way they knew how. When they phoned back, I get to handle the call and they're even more frustrated because the last person hung up on them. So having those strategies, having those tools to know how you can extract yourself from a conversation, from a phone call, um, uh, or a physical situation. Because you have to remember that um, uh, you could be passing that problem onto the next person. Um, we can't always be perfect in that world, but you know, it's something to be conscious of. So I think it's really important that we, our staff, that we, uh, that, that we have the ability to recognize when a situation um, is, uh, is escalating, when it is getting dangerous. We have to have tools 
so that we can de-escalate. Uh, I, I, I refer to taking the heat out of the exchange, cooling things down. Um, uh, and equally, I start creating that distance. So I don't just hang up on the person. I say, um, look, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't seem to be, I don't have access to the solutions you need right now. And if this continues, I may need to end the conversation. So I don't just, it's not a cold, like, and I leave. I've actually, I've actually uh, alerted them to the direction I'm moving. Um, uh, I might just, you know, uh, if it's a physical situation, I might just step to the other side of the car. So there's the, the car is now uh, a, a, um, a barrier between me and them. I may open the car door and that signals that mm, I'm getting ready to end this exchange. I'm also set up to, to depart. Um, interestingly, uh, I talked about that uh, work safe experience where the, ha the, the builder threw a hammer at me. Um, I was very intentional from that point forward. Whenever I parked, I always parked so that uh, uh, I was facing the exit. I didn't have to reverse. I could just start driving forward. Um, it's that uh, uh, preparation for escape. So <clears throat> I've now got my four layers, um, my four planning stages, I suppose you could say. Uh, I'm gonna bring it back to our bow tie. We've done the thinking, we've done the planning, but it comes down to training. Uh, and I'm gonna introduce this term, rehearse for success. In context of, or in the, con, in, in, the, in the place of training, I want you to reflect back on the judges ruling from Ashburton. Staff needed to be trained in the, um, the tools that were to be used um, uh, trained in de-escalation and trained in what to do when it started going southwards, uh, when it started going in that undesirable direction. Training, training, training. I think part of that training and a really, really valuable uh, uh, dimension to the training is this concept of rehearse for success. And I learned this, uh, this technique or this approach from... Um, uh, two friends of mine who I worked with at Outward Bound in the States, amazing couple, um, uh, just really high emotional intelligence. Well, that's what I perceived it to be. Um, and I think it was. Um, I thought it was intuitive. I thought it was natural to them. And they're like, no, no, we work really, really hard to, for this when they were just in the evenings after work or you know what we would think of as time they were relaxing they would come up with scenarios you know um hey tracy how would you respond to this situation if i did this what if they'd find these challenging situations these places where if it happened in real time, they knew it would be stressful for them, that the emotional drivers would kick in and those emotional drivers could result in a bad outcome, that they would respond in a bad way. But they'd do it in these times when they're relaxed, when they're communicating, when they're in a good space together, and they would, they would have the conversation. And though Tracy might say, oh, well, if you said that to me or if you did that, my response would be this and you know phil would say oh that wouldn't work I, I would respond like that and they're like well what would work and they would come up with with phrases with lines with responses um, uh, that um, would be successful and in and inevitably when those those pressured situations when somebody did something that annoyed the other person the other person was ready with a response that took the heat out of the exchange that de-escalated the situation. And I believe we can do this with our staff. Um, uh, you know, the, a number of regional councils now um, are doing this. Um, they have um, planned responses um, or uh, rehearsed responses for um, uh, 
uh, ratepayers and members of the public who are phoning up and venting and and, and being threatening or uh, aggressive or angry to the staff and they have these lines that they've rehearsed it's not the first time they've said it they've practiced it before it ever was a, a problem um so um yeah i'm really i'm really selling this idea of rehearse for success practice the stuff when it's not a problem so that when the when it's a, a, a heated exchange um uh, people are um uh are comfortable that they're, they're fluent in, in those those lines that's really what i have for you um uh i throw it open to um a question and answer session um uh, you know yeah one of my things i often say is you know that you read all the work safe stuff and i always say do a risk assessment do a risk assessment and that's true but it's such it's, it's not comfortable language uh, nobody really likes doing a risk assessment um doing a risk assessment in the heat of the moment in a, a dynamic situation is is kind of a bit bizarre um it's only kind of strange you know nerdy people like me that actually fully enjoy doing a risk assessment we need to take this to our people um uh and get them to feel comfortable not with the risk assessment but the planning that we're putting into it to the thinking that you know what is the threats that we face um in this work environment not the not those rest of world you know big scary things but the day-to-day -day, you know where is how does this occur who does it occur from where is it occurring oh okay um how are we designing the way we go about our work um again you see this in a lot of regulatory agencies they're setting staff to go in and create an adversarial relationship or we'll design it so it's different I, again i take my example of the u.s park service the authority of the resource stand next to the person uh have a collaborative conversation uh you know don't try yelling ask the person you know get into a space where you can talk um uh, think about how you're putting in the separation, how you're protecting your staff as you're feeling out the space, as you're getting a, a, accustomed to what's the nature of this interaction. Um, yeah, there you go. Questions? Excellent. Uh, thank you very much for that, Matthew. Um, guys, if you've got any questions for myself or for Matthew, please use the Q&A function right now. While you guys are typing in your questions, um, I would really appreciate a quick question remember all uh, answers are anonymous so please feel free to answer uh honestly the question is popping up right now has this webinar been of value to you and would you do things differently in your workspace yes i find it of value and i'll do things differently yes it's great to obtain confirmation or i didn't really learn anything new today so let's see those questions um, um there's one question matthew for you so far is um how do you cross that bridge uh, from a worker's perspective when, when they think about or they throw it at you big brother? So talking about that, all those controls you can put in place from wearable cameras to GPS devices, et cetera, et cetera. And I understand the reasoning why, but how do you cross that bridge from a worker perspective when they feel like, oh, this is just the company trying to monitor my uh, productivity and my behavior. And I feel like this is inter they're crossing the line from privacy perspective. Mm. So the GPS device in itself, so location tracking. Um, uh, it's to me that sits not exclusively, but just see that as sitting in the recovery space. Basically, if you think that knowing where your staff are is going to help you protect them um is a little bit flawed it gives it, it it means you know where to where to where to take the first aid kit um uh so um it's location tracking is a really important uh, and valuable tool for certain workforce certain workers certain work types um i'm not sure uh I haven't fully I haven't fully comprehended it in the context of protecting my staff from violence and aggression. 
Um, the camera, I will focus on the camera a little bit. Um, uh, and, I th and there is some insight, I think, for the, the location tracking in my response to this. Um, yes, it could be used to criticize, to performance manage a worker. It can, no denying it. So you need to, if you want to um, get the workers to embrace it and feel good about it, we need to take it from a relational place. Um, uh, and um, so good, don't just roll it out and say, everybody's wearing this, trial it. You know, get a couple of, um, find those key influences, those people that um, the rest of the workforce respect and listen to, but that maybe are a little bit skeptical, that are like, oh, I'm not sure if this is going to work. Trial it with them. Get them to put it on and just say, we'd like you to wear this for two weeks so we can find out if it's an effective tool. By the way, we've got to this point because we read some research, not the, the, the provider's sales pitch, not their marketing brochure, but we actually read the research that says this could help us. That's why we're thinking about this, but we'd like you to come on the journey. So your, your, your true engagement at this point um, and your key influencers, especially if they're just that little bit skeptical, they'll be like, oh, they'll give it a shot. And then they will sell it to the people. Um, one place where we introduced or I introduced body cameras, um, uh, I started using the footage to train staff, uh, this rehearse for success concept. Um, we didn't just uh, pull up the footage and, uh, and say, hey, everybody, watch this interaction and give your feedback. We did it far more delicately and um, uh, kind of sensitively. So I went to the worker that was involved in the exchange and said, hey, I, would, I think there's some real value that, could, that everybody could gain, could learn from seeing this footage. How would you feel about presenting the footage and saying the three or two or whatever take home points that you have? Um, so they were in control of what got said. And uh, in the first stages of doing this, we didn't invite any response from the other people. The only person that got to say anything about the exchange was the person involved. So we're protecting them. We're protecting their ego, um, their experience, their feelings. Um, and people got used to the idea of like, oh, wow, yeah, this is a, this is a heated exchange and things don't always go perfectly, but we can learn from it. And then we introduced some controlled feedback from the audience. So um, uh, I would like you to make one observation of something you saw. I'd like you to make an observation on one thing you heard from this video footage. And I'd like you to make one comment on an alternative that could have been, you know, something different that could have been done. No, no, you know, uh, open slather feedback. And over time, over three months of doing this, of using video footage in this really controlled and respectful manner, the team really responded and they were looking forward to having their peers review the footage because they were seeing so much learning come out of it. It was that rehearsed for success. So I think it's about the way you use the tool, the way you introduce it. Um, if it's top down, you're gonna struggle. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, we've got one more question and, and then our time is up. So Matt, thinking of um, training, you know, we've mentioned training is pretty key when it comes to uh, violence and aggressive behavior. So you've made, you emphasize that, you know, rehearsal is pretty important. So in your experience from, if you think about the industry, you know, not everybody's got um, high, a big budget to have individuals on site doing rehearsal training uh, all, all the time and uh, to get people through that training because it costs the company quite a lot. Uh, so in your experience, which type of training medium uh, would you recommend uh, for VAB training, which is basically the best bang for your buck? Ooh. 
So, because I mean, in my this is just ways he's talking about. So, in my opinion, you could have normal online things that you go through. You can have um, um, virtual reality. You have in-person training, etc. So, um, I'm just I'm also just curious mm. to understand from your point of view. Yeah, great question, uh, and and I don't have a um, a single answer for all. I think you need to take the context of your workplace. So if you're if you're a place with a large wad, wad of cash and a cash register, um, um, the uh, the thing that you need to train for is going to be different from if you're just dealing with um, customers that are frustrated that the product is broken again. Contextual. Um, so focus on focus your training on your 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 not just it's not just the threat but the weakest point in your um protective strategy um i suppose um this rehearsed success it doesn't have to be expensive it doesn't have to be complicated every single one of us at some point will have a team meeting and that could be an all of company team meeting or it could be a, a, a three person team. How about you just you just emailed the team leader or the supervisor or whatever and said at your team meeting, I would I would like you to to discuss how you would respond to this situation to this scenario. It's a 10 minute conversation and you might say I'd like you to discuss this and come up with this is the best response that we came up with you know there you go you've just practiced it or you could send them a question and say here's the scenario how would you de-escalate from this moment and people will you know it's it's a 10 minute conversation it doesn't have to be expensive or uh, expansive um uh but again if, if your threat profile is you know really high really scary yeah you're going to have to invest more money and more time in that there's there's no no getting around it um but it, remember you know the cost of the cost of preventing it from happening versus the cost of recovery is always going to go to the balance in favor of prevent mm -hmm. no thank you for that no i appreciate that um, just go to the last slide, please, for me, Matt. Uh, thank you very much for, for that informative webinar, uh, Matthew. We really, really appreciate that. Thank you yet again for taking your time out and sharing some of your experiences today with us. I would also take this time to thank all our participants today. Thank you for being uh, uh, pretty good today, guys. I really appreciate you coming along. Um, you know, Matthew has uh, I talked quite a bit on VAB, so please watch out um, for some other VAB stuff that's, that's still to come and within the shop care that you'll find relevant um, and also uh, please make sure that you uh, register for some of our other webinars and i'll give matthew one last opportunity just to speak to um, everyone today uh, before we say goodbye uh <laughs> like I've, I've had the microphone for a really long time so thank you for thank you for um bearing with me and uh, i'd just like to reiterate um uh Delivery in this webinar format is, is new to me. I'm used to having an audience that I can feed off. So a um, uh, lot of learning for me in the space. Please, if there's any uh, any um, uh, anything you'd like me to hear about what worked and what didn't work, um, either share that with me directly or uh, uh, or via Wes. Um, uh, that would be really you know that's my that's what I'm going to gain from today. Um, and uh, again, you know, I, I just want to say, you know, it doesn't matter how it presents itself, it doesn't matter what form it is, whether it's verbal, uh, tone of voice or physical, this is all harm and it has an impact on us, on, on our people. And, and just on that, that sense of um, uh, levity that a person can feel coming to work. So I take a really intolerant position on this stuff um uh yeah for too long new zealanders have been like you know just shrug it off oh water off a duck's back she, you know ah, it's nothing it's sticks and stone nah this stuff is real um uh again you know you want to talk about the mental health crisis in new zealand so let's let's front foot this um yeah there you go
Thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much for, uh, to you, Matthew. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I hope you have a good one and hope to see you at our next webinar. Uh, take care. See ya. Thanks, Wes.